Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third and final episode of our 2020 Planet Forward Virtual Summit Series. We've been convening over these past Fridays, the past three Fridays here in October, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this final uh, encounter that we're going to have here. I'm Frank Sesno. I started Planet Forward at the George Washington University a little over 10 years ago as a place to bring students and experts and scientists and advocates and all sorts of people together to look at the issues confronting the planet, sustainability, and the stories around them, the narratives that we can develop to tell those stories and move the planet forward. I want to thank all of our sponsors who have helped make this possible, uh, with a special call out uh, this week to One Tree Planted, one of our newest partners, and they are planting a tree for every person who attends this summit series over these last three Fridays, so it's not too late. If you want to get on your social media and bring more friends, bring people you know uh, to this gathering here today, we'd love to have them. And that number, the largest number we get, will be the number of trees one tree planted plants. They're helping to reforest parts of California with this project that have been devastated in recent years by wildfires. I also want to thank our pillar schools and our consortium schools and our Planet Forward correspondents. So Planet Forward has this wonderful network, this amazing network of schools and students and Planet Forward correspondents who are students who tell these stories from across the country, diverse schools, and we're delighted that you're with us and we've got people um, who have been with us throughout uh, all of these summits. Normally we meet in person, today we're meeting here again in my house, oh well. Um, I want to remind you that we're going to have a series after this hour of tremendous breakout sessions, and I'll have more on that for you later, but after we have this conversation here, you take a very quick break, and then you can join one of these breakout sessions where you can really learn hands-on skills about how to be a more effective storyteller, about how to have the narratives that you tell drive action, have impact, and, and how to use your debate skills uh, to tell a, a, a very clear and, and compelling story. Um, we're meeting at a remarkable time. And we do this on purpose. We're just days away from an election. We're in the middle of a terrible pandemic. Uh, we see social unrest and a racial reckoning across the country. And we see a climate in crisis. This has led to great calls for action and a real intense mobilization, especially a mobilization uh, from young people. And we're gonna to talk to and about that in just a minute. But it's also about how we capture these issues and tell them and convey them and the characters we put in them as to how we inform and organize and mobilize and act. Over the course of these three uh, weeks of Summit series, we've been very deliberate about where our focus has been. Environmental equity, inclusion, and institutional change, and the narratives that propel them. And we've heard initially, our first uh, episode here, from a community activist, uh, Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. We heard in our second segment from President Shirley Collado. She's president of Ithaca College and she's trying to create deep change within an institution, institutional change. Today, we're going to hear from um, Susan Jen Davis. She's the chief sustainability officer of Comcast NBC Universal. It's a media company. It's a corporation that is distributed across the country and really around the world. And there'll be a fascinating conversation as to how this company is both mm, managing its own sustainability activities as well as how it tells the story. But I wanna start with you and, and the students who really form the, the base constituency of Planet Forward. What's remarkable in this season of change and decision is the mobilization of young people, of students and others. Um, it's the Black Lives Matter movement, it's the climate strike movement, it's the March for Our Lives movement, all of the movements that have been so generated and powered by students and young people. And what we're hearing in early voting actually is that um, the young vote, the youth vote is exceeding uh, potentially where it's ever been before, certainly in modern times. So I wanna open with a conversation with some of our prize students and, um, and correspondents. Uh, Kate Twining Ward, uh, student at the George Washington University where I hang out. Uh, she was a Planet Forward correspondent, a StoryFest winner. She joins us from Copenhagen in Denmark. Hi, Kate. Hello, Frank. Uh, we have Jabria Bell. Jabria is a, a student at Tuskegee University. 
Uh, she's working on a story uh, for Planet Four. We're going to talk to her about that. Hi, Jabria. Hi, Frank. <laughs> it's good to see you. And finally, Jake Myers. Jake is uh, hails from the University of Arizona. Was also a Planet Forward correspondent. I should say that both Jake and Kate were Story Fest winners. We have this remarkable Story Fest prize. Jake, good to see you. Good to see you too, Frank. Thanks. Um, so I want to start with with all three of you. And Jake, I'd like you to kick this off if you would. Um, I I spoke a moment ago about what we've been doing in this Planet Forward Summit series, looking at environmental equity, inclusion, and this notion of institutional change. And I'm, this is really a question for all of you, but, but Jake, why don't you get it going for us here? Um, what are you looking for in, you know, when you, when you think change, when you think inclusion from your perspective, what are you thinking? Well, I think it all starts with how do we frame the issue? And so take an issue like climate change. When we frame the issue of climate change, we think about it as like a war or a fight. And we think about it as a, a condition that can be achieved but really it's a process that we need to engage with. And what we're engaging in is transformational pathways towards big societal and political change. And so we need to start by getting better stories about those issues. And with those better stories, we can get better decisions that will uh, create change, I think. Jake, tell people a little bit about yourself. You've done stories for Planet Forward. Uh, in fact, you, you won a, the Story Fest prize. Uh, you're at University of Arizona. Uh, what, do you, what did you study and what are you doing now? And what was that story? So I was a master's of development practice student at the University of Arizona, and I focused on international climate resiliency. And during my studies uh, as a correspondent, I got the chance to go out and interview uh, an urban farmer in Nairobi, Kenya, who uh, reinvented different ways in which we can tackle our food security crisis while also addressing climate concerns. So what was he doing? He was farming on a very small piece of land with a lot of diverse uh, plants and diverse animal species in a very compact area. And what do you want to do with your own professional trajectory? How do you want to work with this stuff? I want to include storytelling as a way, as a tool in which we can increase resiliency to disasters or climate change. I think um, better stories create better decisions. I think. Shabria, let me come to you next. Um, Tuskegee, you're what? What year are you? I am a junior here at Tuskegee University, studying agriculture business with a minor in sustainable agriculture and international relations. So sustainable agriculture and international relations, uh, you want to go into global development or humanitarian work? What are you thinking about? Um, yes, sir. I actually do want to go into more sustainable agriculture as well as global agriculture. So possibly trade and just helping underdeveloped countries with the tools and resources they need to farm and um, other things in agriculture. Yes, sir. I asked Jake, my opening question here for all of you is, you know, where, where do you think the change needs to happen from your perspective, from your generational perspective, where inclusion and change, what are you looking for? So my personal outlook really um, dives into the black community because I am black, I am African-American. So especially in the agriculture world, um, we are underrepresented, especially black farmers and um, just the black community as a whole, you know, agriculture and fresh fruits and fresh ve um, vegetables are not only not accessible, as accessible as in um, other um, large represented communities, um, but um, the mindset of the black community and the fruits and vegetables, they want to have access and they want to have these things, but they also don't have the education and the resources to know and understand what these crops and what these produce can do for their body and just how to cook them and right. how to um, have them in there incorporated in their everyday life. Now, I know that you're that this is part of a, a project that you're working on that will be a story that you're doing for Planet 4. We'll be looking forward to seeing that posted there. What's the story you're going to tell? Who's Who does it revolve around? So my story is actually here in Tuskegee University. I work with the local farmer's market. So the two main characters in my story will be Mr. Al Hooks. He is a part of the Al Hooks Produce Farm and Mr. Denzel Veal, who works also with the black farmers at the farmer's market. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. And, and do, what, what about them? I mean, are, is your story about their success or their struggle or what they're up against? What, what, are, you, what are you doing? Well, 
about both. It's mm-hmm. about um, Mr. Al's struggles because he is actually 72 years old and he has had his farm his whole entire life and he's passing it down for generations. So we get to look at the challenges he's faced um, with discrimination and racism within um, getting loans and grants and just farming in general and competing in the market with these other large farmers as well as the aspect of the community um, and just having, because we are part of the Black Belt Alabama and we do, we are considered food insecure and Tuskegee itself does not have a lot of access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So just getting the farmer's market out there and um, Denzelville has actually created an app called Access. And so we will dive in a little bit more and how just how important it is to have access to these fruits and vegetables in the Black community where, you know, oftentimes we are left out. That is great. I, I'm, it's so interesting. So many of the stories that we have gotten from students over the years at Planet Forward have focused on the issue of food, food insecurity. It's something that really um, people get and it resonates, but it's a huge problem that still needs to be addressed. And actually, it's something that I'll talk about with Susan Jen Davis in a bit because she and Comcast have actually focused on food as well. Kate Twining Ward, let me come to you. Uh, you're sitting there in Copenhagen, Germany, uh, Denmark. So I should start by asking you, uh, what are you doing there? Um, I'm continuing my studies. I'm a junior as well. I'm studying environmental studies and geography and minoring in sustainability. So you're a Planet Forward correspondent as well. Congratulations on your win. Uh, You want to tell folks about the story uh, that you did that uh, that triumphed? Sure. Um, The story that I wrote was about um, an internship that I did in Sierra Leone at a chimpanzee sanctuary uh, last summer. And it's about how chimpanzees are being affected by climate change and why they need to be considered. And furthermore, why we really need to consider the communities that are living in closest proximity to conservation areas when we're looking at big conservation projects. Kate, when you think about environmental equity, when we talk about environmental equity and inclusion, what resonates with you? For me, I think it's really important that we focus on global change and not just change in the United States. I think oftentimes we neglect to see environmental problems um, from a global perspective. And in order to truly have environmental conclusion, inclusion, we need to consider the places that are often missing from the conversation, because in many cases, these are the places that are being hit the hardest. Um, and we need to look at these from different lenses. So for example, I'm, I'm in Denmark right now. They're very different you know, standards for sustainability and notions of collective engagement with environmental issues that I feel something is something that we in the U.S. could could learn from. I was really struck by the story that you did, one of the stories you did for Planet Forward, where you talked about <clears throat> going to, um, you know, when you went abroad and you went to Africa and, and it was not what you expected and it, it made you sort of stop and think and reassess. Uh, what did, mm. what, how did that change you? Well, it changed me in a sense where I think I just had a a different perspective on how we need to tackle um, environmental issues. I think that it was really difficult for me going somewhere for a short amount of time and and not making a long lasting impact and just coming to terms with the fact that these issues are so complex and there's a lot of different parts to it. You know, you need, we desperately need large institutional changes, but we also need individuals who care about specific issues who are willing to make the day-to-day changes. So I think it made me consider both both aspects that we do need these large changes, but we also need the people who are going in and making the small changes who care about specific issues. Let me ask all of you how you connect a narrative to the urgency, Jake. Um, uh, there is no question, and we're seeing it actually, hearing it in, in a lot of the polls and maybe even some of the early exit polls that climate change is a very high priority issue among younger voters. What is it that from your experience, both being a younger voter and being a storyteller that, that connects those dots in, in, in ways that is, that is so important? You know, a couple of weeks ago, um, Reverend Yearwood told us here, he said, this is this generation's lunch counter moment. That's a big statement. Yeah, I think um, we feel more vulnerable than other demographics on an age basis. And I think um, we don't feel like we're being listened to um, from the decision-making point of view. And then I think right now we're in a moment where everybody's feeling vulnerable due to COVID-19. And I think we can use this moment to kind of reconceptualize how we can create change. Um, And I think the sort of listening, um, we're seeing how COVID hits different communities of color and and every other parts of 
of the world differently. And so I think uh, we need to like move on this on this move on this um, energy that's happening around us. Right Jabria, now. what Jabria, what's your take on that? I definitely agree with Jake with the vulnerability and just the not being hurt, especially in the black community, you know, um, with COVID and Black Lives Matter and all of these different things that are hitting the black community, you know, we scream and scream and scream and we ask for different things like justice and access to different things like agriculture and we just feel like we're not being heard. So I just feel it is very important, especially in this election season, that the younger generation gets out and vote because we are the change that we want to see so we can't expect things to happen even though we're begging and begging it is our duty to you know just get if, out if there's, if there's actual change like you're yeah. talking about what would change like five years from now what would be on the what would you check off on that checklist if you're going to get the change that you think needs to happen five years from now and i know that's not a lot i know that is not a long time however five years from now i would like to go into these underrepresented black communities and see a farmer's market i would like to see a something like you know that is accessible for agriculture but especially five years from now with the black lives matter movement i should feel if anything happens with a black life and the death of whatever happens you know a, a larger majority if that is why they lost their life or you know a police brutality matter anything like that that we get justice you know what i'm saying we should not be out in the street marching and marching and marching and then no justice is still served here here uh kate i'm going to start very quickly super quickly one-liners from each of you kate what do you want to do with your life what's your career ambition i want to be a wildlife conservationist awesome jabria i want to help people eat healthy and just learn the true meaning of agriculture jake I want to use storytelling to build resiliency to climate change. All right. Well, you know, it's great talking to all of you. I think it's really important for us to take what you're saying, the pressure for change, the commitment to sustainability, the awareness about climate, and the ability through your communication skills, your storytelling, to persuade and mobilize others. So hang around. We'll come back to you perhaps later in, uh, in, in our summit here uh, for some more conversation or questions to our guests. But I want to thank you all uh, right now and um, wish you all the best. Um, climate change and environmental equity, and food insecurity, they're so closely linked. For the past month here at Planet Forward, we've been collecting your stories. We've been working with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. This is part of our World Food Day Storytelling Award. Normally, we will take our UNFAO students and people who rally around this and we'll take them to Rome, Italy, and they'll participate in World Food Day proceedings with the Committee, Committee on World Food Security. It's an incredible gathering from with people from all around the world. Well, couldn't do that this year. Obviously, COVID intervened, but we did offer uh, to our students an opportunity to share a food story and win a prize, a modest cash prize for everybody. So we get to announce that right now. And it's my pleasure to do that. So in third place, Michaela Campo from the George Washington University. She's a, uh, a BS candidate in environmental studies and international affairs at GW. Her story was redefining pescatarian in a, sustainability, in a sustainable diet. Her story revolved around how we can expand the, the conversation uh, around seafood, which might in, in include, and brace yourself here, cephalopods. If you don't know what a cephalopod is and you haven't eaten one, you can go look it up and check it out. Um, and maybe even algae. Uh, she writes, feeding the growing human population will require culinary innovation, even if it takes some getting used to. So congratulations. Second place goes to the envelope, please, Max Sano uh, at Franklin and Marshall College. Max is a junior at Franklin and Marshall. He's pursuing a degree in government and environmental studies with a minor in Arabic. His story, what's the solution to our problematic food system? And he writes, and this is from his story, even before the pandemic, Americans were struggling with hunger, noting estimates indicating more than 54 million Americans experiencing food insecurity in 2020. In his story, he reflects on the food supply chain, on food waste, uh, challenges to farms, and, and he writes about community farms. The first place winner, Eva Legg from Dartmouth College. Eva is a rising junior at Dartmouth. She's studying ecology, earth sciences, creative writing, her story, headline, Home Sown, Austin's first urban farms and the birth of its locavore movement, Austin as in Austin, Texas. And she tells the stories of Carol Ann Sale, who started the 
Boggy Creek farm stand, Austin's first urban, urban farm, and also the story of Anne Dorsey, uh, of uh, Dorsey Barger is, Barger is her name, who propelled uh, by her two acre farm in the heart of East Austin is credited with spearheading Austin's locavore movement. So Eva writes, in the midst of a global pandemic and a plummeting economy, it's vital now more than ever to invest both in local businesses and in our own well-being. And if I'm not mistaken, Eva is with us now. Eva, you there? Look at that. Yes. Hi, Eva. Congratulations. Hello. Thank you. I got to tell you, your, your story was brilliantly, really beautifully written. If people are curious, and I hope they are, they can go to planetforward.org and, and find your story and all the other winning stories too, and all the other stories from everybody else. But even tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you wrote this story about the locavore movement in Austin, Texas. Yeah, um, I became interested in um, urban farms around my freshman year of high school where I began going out and visiting a lot of urban farms in Austin. Um, I'm an Austin native and I've been a gardener since I was eight. And so um, growing crops in an urban setting has always been something that fascinated me. And um, Boggy Creek Farm has been a farm stand that we've gone to for decades. Um, and in the pandemic, it's just this really wonderful um, escape from life in quarantine. Uh, there's a tap dancer that comes and- A tap dancer wonderful. at the farm market? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you go to good farm markets. I like that. Uh, what, is, what, are, what are your uh, professional aspirations? You're a terrific writer. Uh, you obviously are committed to food. What do you, what do you wanna do? Yeah, um, I'm really interested in going into um, conservation ecology and um, also um, pursuing science writing. Um, not sure which one I will pursue more at the moment, but you might be, I you like might be able to do both. You know, you might actually link the two. All right. Well, Eva, thank you very much. Congratulations again on 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 your on your big win here. We really appreciate it. Sorry, we can't be going to Rome with you and going to the World <laughs> Food Security Conference, but you know, we hope to get back another time. Best of luck to you, and uh, you know, eat well. <laughs> Thank you. All right, take care. When we uh, think about this kind of um, these voices and this activism, it comes from many places. And as I mentioned, across the three weeks here on our Planet Forward Summit, we've heard from a community activist, we've heard from an institutional leader, and now let's think about the private sector. You know, when we think about leadership generally, we often think about government, public sector. But it really is the private sector that, that, that moves so much and where huge change can happen. I mean, a company, for example, decides to buy renewable energy and utility companies now build then, then have to build more solar and wind to um, supply that growing demand. A corporation decides to go carbon neutral or move away from single use plastics. Lindblad Expeditions did just that. And that then fuels the marketplace for sustainable packaging and makes that economically viable. The Empire State Building invests in energy efficiency and completely retrofits itself. What does that do? It attracts new business and that encourages other buildings and businesses to do the same. Well, Comcast NBC Universal is a company with assets and employees all over the country. Um, everyone knows it because it's cable, it's internet, it's television, it's theme parks, it's really public. And I should say that, um, and we're very happy about this, that Comcast is a supporter of Planet Forward. We're thrilled with that. Susan Jim Davis is Comcast NBC Universal's chief sustainability officer. I mean, it's remarkable that a company even has, think of that, a chief sustainability officer. And in that role, she identifies sustainable strategies and practices. She helps set priorities and, and programs. She also serves on Comcast's Diversity Council and has been named one of the most powerful women in cable. She's chair of the board of the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. She is a powerhouse. Now, Susan's gonna take your questions um, and engage you in conversation in just a few minutes, but I wanna set the table for that with a conversation she and I had just a few days ago. I started um, by asking Susan about this season of reckoning in the United States and a statement by Comcast CEO Brian Roberts shortly after the George Floyd killing. He said, and this was a statement that they put out publicly, we want to mobilize as a company to create a more equitable, just, and inclusive society. 
So I asked Susan what that's meant for her and how that brings together the conversation about equity, inclusivity, and sustainability. Well, the announcement that Brian made some months ago around um, social justice and social equity and doing more in this space, and we're going to be investing another $100 million towards that end, is really on top of what we've been doing as a company, as an enterprise in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space for many years. And we're actually considered a leader in, in this area because we have put our money, our people, our resources behind trying to make a difference in this space, whether it's for our employees, whether it's for our customers, whether it's for the viewers that are looking at our programming. I mean, we're really seeking to, to bridge gaps and in digital equity, you already know about internet essentials, which is a broadband product that reaches low income families, low income individuals in the United States. It's the biggest investment the company has been making over the past years. So I think that what this means now with additional commitment is we're gonna go deeper. We wanna go farther. We wanna reach more people. We wanna bridge more gaps and sustainability is one area we can do that. So as the chief sustainability officer, let me ask you about some of those things, okay? Because you've, you've broken it up. Your company breaks it up into four um, impact areas, as you call it. Um, what is it that you're trying to do? Is it, a, is it a corporate operations? Like you're trying to reduce your own carbon footprint? Are you trying to influence others because you're out in the community? Are you pushing that out of the community? You know, we start first with our own carbon footprint because we should. I mean, we're making an impact as an enterprise. And we need to understand what that impact is. We need to see where it is that we can make the most progress around reducing our impact, reducing our emissions. So that's clearly part of it. But that's only one part. The other part is how do we extend that into the community in, in a more proactive way, in a more purposeful way? By virtue of us reducing our emissions, we're affecting our communities, right? I mean, if we if we pollute less, if we divert more from the landfill. You know, all of these things contribute to a community that is going to be better from an environmental perspective. So that's certainly one part of it. The other part of it is, you know, how do we invest in our communities so that they can live more sustainably? How do we address things like food insecurity? And how can we reduce our food waste? Why, why does a media company, I mean, you operate everything from theme parks to theme parks to television networks to internet. Why do you care about food and food insecurity? Why would Comcast get involved with that? Well, I mean, for one, it is one of the biggest problems in the world when it comes to sustainability. Like when you talk about how do you make this world more sustainable for all, addressing food security, food insecurity is a big part of that. I mean, it, we waste so much food. So in, in the United States, we waste almost 40% of the food that we produce. We throw it out. And at the same time, we have one in eight people, one in nine people, depending on where you are in the United States, that are food insecure. So that to me is sort of like a moral issue for us, but, but at Comcast NBC Universal, we also deal with food. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but you know, actually I always tell the story about my daughter being completely unimpressed with my efforts around renewable energy and going to zero emissions and zero waste because she said, there's nothing in your strategy around food and food security. And when I looked closer at the company, I realized we actually deal with food a lot. We have a lot of employees, we feed them in cafeterias. We have theme parks where we've got food venues. So we've got a lot to do with food in our business. So we need to do something about the food waste that we generate ourselves. And then how do we connect that to the communities that we serve? I mean, we're trying to bridge the digital gap, as I mentioned before, but at the same time, these same communities are dealing with food insecurity. Why not couple those two major issues where we can as a big media company, as a big telecom company, as a big company that has the reach we have? Comcast is both a big company, and so you can affect your own behavior and others, and you're a media company, so you can tell the story. But since you're from a media company, how about we play a little game here? Would you be, can we, can we play a lightning round? Uh, well, it depends. Um, if, will I win? Because of course win, you'll win. Then of I'm course you'll win. We only have winners here. Uh, okay, well, if everybody's right. a winner, then definitely. So I want to play the lightning round on the four impact areas, the four areas okay. that you're going. Sure. So we'll we'll do. So if I say lightning round, energy and emissions, what are you doing? We're doing um, on-site solar. We're buying a lot of renewable energy to uh, to operate our network and our businesses, um, and we're also changing our fleet. 
um, over to uh, low emissions vehicles and maybe eventually get to an electrification of our fleet. Okay, not bad. Products and experiences, what's that all about? So that's about designing the the products that we have in the home to be more energy efficient, like, like the what? boxes, like X1, our X1 box, having a power saver mode on it, have it have it operate less with less energy and and still work to give you the best entertainment experience in your house. Um, when we're talking about experiences, we're we're going to be looking at how we operate our water park so that it conserves water um, and reuses water. Um, and also around uh, our, our vehicles that we drive around to, to, to all the customers' homes to make sure that they are being as efficient as possible. So those are some of the initiatives we're doing. All right, door number three, materials and waste. Materials and waste goes to, let's try to design our products so that the packaging gets plastic out of it altogether. And we- Really, you wanna get, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're gonna get plastic out of it altogether? plastic wrap. I mean, this is one that's aspirational, right? How can we use materials that are recyclable, that are reusable, that are not made of plastic, that will not pollute the earth? How can we package differently? And, and I think the customer will really love that as well, because they'll know that they're buying from a company that really cares about uh, the resources and cares about the earth. Okay, last one then in our lightning round, engagement and outreach. Engagement and out outreach is about making sure that our employees know what we're doing in the sustainability area and they get engaged and they begin to incorporate sustainability into their job. It's about reaching customers and getting them engaged and getting them motivated to do better for the earth. It's about using our media reach, our news reach to be able to educate and create awareness so that again, we can create a global community around sustainability. And how are you doing that on that last one, Susan, the engagement? How are you changing the way you outreach and engage to engage communities of color, to engage um, under-resourced, underserved communities, to make this the kind of inclusive movement that it needs to be and that our racial reckoning demands that it should be because environmental justice is a gigantic issue that has really been, not been um, addressed honestly and squarely. I mean, when you look at the communities that are most affected by polluted air, by the lack of clean water, by the lack of good food, I mean, these are communities of color. These are low-income communities that are hurting and are hurting even more now given COVID-19. And so our investment in communities have always been around trying to bridge gaps and trying to invest in communities in partnership so that together we can work towards better living conditions and equality and justice. So environmental justice is just another sort of theme that we're starting to work harder on in terms of working with communities to empower them and to enable them and to equalize the situation that and, they're in. And maybe you could talk about as part of this, this $100 million that Comcast has committed to the communities and whether and how the climate equity component is a part of that. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many organizations that we're already invested in, um, you know, such as like in Philadelphia, there's a there's an organization called Phil Abundance, and they offer warehousing of uh, food that then is distributed to food banks that feed people who are food insecure. So we're already in partnership with organizations like that. There's HopeWorks, an organization that works with, um, you know, at-risk youth and we're working on a curriculum that will help to teach the youth around, you know, how they can be more sustainable, how that they can use technology and innovation to create things that will, you know, address some of the biggest problems that our city is facing. And so those investments have already been happening. So now it's just a matter of kind of like drilling down more and doing more in all of the areas that we're already invested in. So I think that together with that and then broadcasting what we're doing so that people end up, you know, once they know about a good idea and that'll help to perpetuate these good ideas and best practices to other communities and get more people engaged and get more people involved in the solutions that we're seeing and we're working with organizations on. Well, you said the magic word a moment ago, broadcast. So you've been doing a lot of that on the NBC Universal side. Al Roker, for example, he talks a lot about weather, but he also talks a lot about climate change when he looks at hurricanes, when he looks at sea level rise, when he looks at coastal damage after a storm comes through. Chuck Todd, Meet the Press, had a whole special edition 
around climate change. Brace yourselves for dangerous heat. The drought we're in is disastrous. Everyone ought to be worried about it. Rainfall amounts really are staggering. About everything we own was destroyed. How is Comcast, how is NBC Universal changing the way, or how has it changed the way it's covering and focusing on these stories? One, to give the urgency to the climate change issue that it deserves, and two, to make that a more inclusive conversation. Well, I mean, I think in general, NBC Universal does a, an amazing job around just reporting facts and educating people and, and encouraging people to look deeper into certain topics and to create more awareness. So there, I think we're doing that already. But on the tip, on the topic of climate change, you know, it really comes down to people. And the way Al Roker addresses this is that climate change is having an impact on people, on communities, on neighborhoods, on companies, on businesses, and that's having a real world impact. And connecting to people on that topic is the way in which we're able to get them involved in figuring out what we can do as a community of people, as a global community on, in the area of climate change. And I think that Al and others are doing such a great job of providing information and education, but then getting people interested in making a difference and making a change. What, what is your advice to people who may be at the beginning of their careers as to how they can pursue this, if this is something they care about, and how they can aspire to have the kind of influence and effect that you have had um, in, 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 your, in your trajectory? I think it first starts at a very personal level. I mean, what can you do as an individual to reduce your carbon footprint? And that gets down to the way you live your life. So it starts personal at the personal level. And what really is great about the personal commitment is that it actually catches fire because if you, your friends and your family see that you're doing these things, you will be surprised at how many people decide that they are going to be inspired to do the same. Um, work with a nonprofit that's addressing some of these issues around food security or around waste, um, and, and you can invest in that regard. And and then just you know you know let your let your government officials, your representatives know how you feel about these issues, and and do your part as a citizen, your civic duty uh, to get the the word out about how important these things are. So those are just some ideas. I'm sure that the young people will know many more ideas than I can bring up, but those are just ones that I'm thinking of right now. And I'll throw in, connect in a good way and constructively and mobilize others on social media and vote and do all the important things that, that we Absolutely. need to do. Absolutely, so important. And they know more about the social media world than we do, so I'm sure they can do better. And I wanna thank you again too, because we're really excited at Planet Forward, looking forward to working with Comcast, creating the Comcast Planet Forward Fellows, the Student Storytelling Fellows, and we're working on that, and there'll be more to, more to talk about on that. But uh, I just wanna thank you for, for everything you do and for this uh, terrific partnership that we've got. Thanks, Frank. We're really looking forward to telling stories together on this important topic. Susan, thanks so much. Thanks, Frank. And Susan joins us now. Hi, Susan. Hey, Frank. How are you? Good. You know, well, we both changed shirts since our, uh, <laughs> our conversation no. the other day. Uh, we have a number of students and a number of questions. Uh, I'm going to go to those in, in just a second. But I do want to mention, we had said that Al Roker would join us. You know, this is the news business. And in the middle of the night, Al was called away. So Al sends his regrets. And uh, uh, we hope Al can join us another time. But uh, what we are going to do, Susan, when we're done here, you and I, is we're, I'm going to speak with Megan Parker. Megan is the executive director of the Society of Environmental Journalists. So we'll hear from uh, the journalists and how we tell that story. Uh, but a number of questions are revolving around um, how uh, uh, some of the things you talked about. And I want to go to one of our students who has joined us and has been a, a correspondent with us, Francesca Edrelin. Francesca, go ahead. Uh, you can join us via, via camera. I think we've got you there. And uh, feel free to uh, pose your question to, to Susan Jim Davis. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Susan, for your inspiring commitment to corporate sustainability. Um, so my question is, um, just to introduce myself, I'm a Plant Forward correspondent. I'm a junior at GW studying international affairs and journalism and sustainability. Um, and my question is, while making individual sustainable changes is important, it's quite daunting to know that only 100 companies are responsible for approximately 71% of the world's carbon emissions. 
So my question is, how much does individual action matter in the environmental movement? Or where does this individual action matter when it's really the large companies who are mostly responsible for global emissions? Well, thanks, Francesca. Really great question. I mean, I really do think that it's a two part thing, right? The first is that individuals should do it. It's the right thing to do, right? So from an integrity perspective, I think we ought to be committed to doing these things. But I also think that movements are started with one thing, with one spark. So to me, even if you're just one individual, you have people in your world in your orbit that you can influence and they have people and they have people and I think that's how movements get built they start somewhere and they do start with individuals so I don't want to discount the importance of individual contribution and how they can create a movement however you're right you've got these companies that also in my opinion ought to join forces as well and again to me that is why a company like my own is important in spreading the word and being very transparent about what we're doing in talking about sustainability and environmental justice a lot because we too can influence our colleagues in the corporate world. And just like individuals can create a movement, companies can cre create movements as well amongst themselves. And then we can put our additional resources behind uh, really pushing this, um, this boulder forward. So I think both are important, but you're absolutely right. And I'm hoping that um, as a corporate citizen, Comcast NBC Universal can influence others and then they in turn can influence others and we can really continue to make this a big priority amongst all of us together. It's not gonna be one that does it. It's gotta be public, private sector, government. All of us need to work together in order to address this very serious issue of climate change. But really good question, so thanks. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, Susan, here's a question from Jackie who asks, is Comcast pursuing any certification programs to validate their efforts such as LEED or True Zero Waste certification? Thanks. Another good question. And the answer is yes. We have a number of different buildings uh, that we have constructed that are LEED Platinum, LEED Silver. Um, I'm looking at the Comcast Philadelphia headquarters campus, for example, LEED Platinum. Uh, we have Telemundo headquarters, also LEED certified as well. Um, as we look for new build opportunities, we're looking at LEED. We're looking at how we can build in a way and operate those new buildings in a way that really honor the environment and that take the environment into consideration. But then we're also looking at existing facilities, existing buildings, and we're not stopping at just, well, let's move forward. Going forward, we'll build that way. But we're looking at how can we also do better within the buildings that we have already operating. So there's a lot of things around energy efficiency. There's things around uh, you know, reducing waste, as we talked about in the interview, Frank. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we do things new and old. Uh, Jake uh, is with us. Jake was part of that conversation, our roundtable a little while ago. He's got a question for you, Jake Myers. You with us? There you go. Yes, great. Thank you, Susan. So I was curious, um, when I Google the term sustainability, I get the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. But what you're talking about is innovation and transformation. Do you think your job title needs to be transformed to like chief resilience officer or does it need to be retold to better tell the story of the work that you're doing? Maybe you can go with me to the powers that be at Comcast and uh, we can try to negotiate something that's, uh, that's better. I love that titling. Um, I really do think sustainability is a couple things that are sort of maybe beyond what people automatically think of when they hear the term. The first is it's not just about environmental responsibility, right? I mean, it's about you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's about those bigger problems that make life um, less sustainable for everybody and everything. So I think there's that piece. And then the piece that you're talking about is transformation and innovation. And as a big technology company, as a company that believes in fostering innovation and, and investing in you know, startups and other companies that are doing those innovative things, that's the other part. Because if you unleash people to solve a problem and to be creative and you challenge them to do that, and, and, and say that you're gonna be able to solve a big problem, you will be amazed at what you unleash. And so I think that innovation equals sustainability. I think it is the pathway because whatever we're doing today cannot be sustained. We need to continue to look at what we're doing and change them, change our practices, change our operations, change our point of view. And that is a continual process. That doesn't just end. It's not like one and done. Okay, I'm, I've, I've been innovative and I need to move on. Um, and I think that that what you were talking about is how do you foster change? 
that's a continual process that I'd love to continue to talk with you and others about because that is innovation and that will solve some of these problems that we're talking about. Well, if this was a, a, a job interview, this got off to a very good start. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's interviewing me though, Frank. I, I, I don't know so. if I got the job. <laughs> Jake, thanks for the question. Thanks, Jake. Um, here, here's a tougher one for you, uh, Susan. This is from uh, Oscar Sykes from uh, Middlebury College, uh, also one of our correspondents, I believe. Yeah. Um, and he said, when Joe Biden said we need to transition away from oil in the last presidential debate, most of the media joined talking points of fossil fuel companies, Oscar says, in jumping on his statement as a gaffe. He asks, given this current state of discourse, how can the media talk about the need for rapid decarbonization as a given rather than just as a partisan belief? Oscar, tough question, but, but I can answer it this way. You know, to me, it's not a political matter that companies, that individuals, that organizations ought to be doing something around climate change. I think it's, to me, it's sort of a fact that we need to be responsible to the earth and we need to, to walk gently on this planet and figure out ways to, to do better for it. Um, and the way that Comcast is looking at it is, for example, we have a zero emissions goal and we have a goal to get to 100% renewable energy. So practically speaking, that is looking at alternatives to fossil fuels for our operations. Um, and, and to me, that's not only good to do because it's the right thing to do, but it also makes us a better company. We operate better. I think clean energy is a better operational choice for us. I think operating efficiently and looking for ways to cut down on our energy use is a good operating company. I think looking at ways to make our fleet um, you know, have them be low admission, low emission, or looking at electrification of our fleet is the right thing to do. It is a good vehicle to consider to get to our customers and to provide stellar service to them, and it reduces our emissions. So all of these things, they're not political. They're about being a good business and being a good corporate citizen. So for me, moving away from fossil fuels is among the things that we've said we're going to do aspirationally, and we're actually doing that now. We are taking those steps. There is a question. There's yeah. a question here from Stephanie. Yeah, there's a question that's related right to this, Susan, from Stephanie, who asks, who notes that Comcast has introduced electric vehicles in its fleet. You talked about that. Um, how's it doing on that goal? And uh, it ties right back to what Oscar was asking about. So where are you on the electric fleet? And as more come to market, is Comcast going to go fully electric? What's the plan? You know, Frank, I talked earlier about the fact that, you know, we took a look at our emissions profile and we said, where do we have opportunity? You know, we need to know where we're actually creating emissions and then focus on reducing those. And one of them is related to our fleet. We have one of the largest fleets in the country. Maybe people don't understand that. You have one of the largest fleets in the country, really? That's complex. right. That's right. So that's a lot of trucks. That's a lot of vehicles. We also have news vehicles, sports vehicles for the NBC side of our house. Um, so, you know, transportation, that's on our mind when we look at how we can reduce our, our carbon footprint. And yes, we're now looking at incorporating and we are incorporating low emission vehicles into that fleet. We're looking at the operational practical realities of that. You know, where can we get charged up? Where can our technicians get charged up? How does that model work? We're having our technicians take a look at that and begin to drive those vehicles. And we're working with the large manufacturers to say, can you design the truck that meets Comcast needs? Because we have particular needs around the vehicles that we need to get to customers. So it is real, it is being roadmapped, and we are working diligently to operationalize that and, and more to come on that because we will be there. But you don't have a hard deadline a year by which you're gonna be all electric. You need to see sort of the critical mass in the, in the, in the sort of vehicles and charging stations before you can really do that probably, yes? Yeah, I mean, we need to get the vehicles that actually right. meet our needs. Right. We right. need to make sure right. that the electric charging infrastructure is like widely available. Right. So, you know, cause we have a footprint that's across the whole United States, sure. you know, make sure we can actually charge the vehicles. But yes, we are going to roadmap. We are roadmapping that now. And that is a critical part of our journey towards uh, getting to lower emissions. So Oscar a moment ago asked how the media side is covering this. And uh, unfortunately, Al Roker couldn't be with us in person, but he's with us um, in spirit. And here's a short clip from Climate in Crisis um, that Al hosted as part of the climate coverage that NBC Universal is doing. Take a quick look. 
Paul Roker on our green roof here at 30 Rock in New York. It's the perfect place to talk about small steps we can all take to protect our planet as we face a climate in crisis. At the top of the world, the Earth is firing a warning shot. A huge factor in sea level rise is happening right here in Greenland. Greenland has enough ice to raise sea levels globally by 25 feet. With temperatures rising, hundreds of millions of people around the world would be affected. Cities are at risk, but while that may seem like a problem years away, right now, this should be one of the best summers of their lives. Everyday life is already changing. We are trying to make the world aware of this. And livelihoods are already being threatened. We probably lost something in the order of about 500 customers this summer. So I just hit the permafrost. You just hit the permafrost. In Alaska, we go underground to see what's thawing beneath the surface. NBC News now presents Climate in Crisis. So, Susan, I want to first congratulate you and NBC and thank you for what you've done here. Um, it's a very significant shift in the way this story is being reported, both on NBC and elsewhere. We're past the point of uh, really highlighting the, whether there's debate, whether there is climate change or not. And what journalists are now doing and what Al is doing is going right to the crisis part and taking us around the world introducing us to the people who are experiencing this change and who are at the forefront of the ideas, the research, the innovation. Um, is there a broad narrative like this to the NBC uh, coverage? What are they trying to convey to, to their audience? I think NBC News does the best in terms of covering this issue as far as I'm concerned. And obviously, I have a lot of respect for Al and we're so honored that we can partner with him on telling stories around this very important topic. You know, I think the way NBC, and I, and I don't wanna speak for NBC, but I can say that from my vantage point, NBC is seeking to show all the different effects that climate change has on us. Whether it is, you know, the, the natural disasters that are happening, whether it is around food and food security, you know, whether it is around sort of animal life, plant life and effects like that, because that is what climate change is about. It's about all of those impacts, wide sweeping, big impacts that quite frankly, all of us or each of us can, can relate to in some way or another. So, so that storytelling is really around having that relational relationship with viewers so that people can say, my gosh, I can relate to that, or I'm worried about that, or I like wildlife, I like nature, whatever your interest is, you can connect to that. And if you connect to that, I think NBC wants you to get activated on that, to do uh, something uh, about it. Absolutely. And I think, and this is a point that I would make in the NBC coverage, it's a point that I would make to all of our viewers and all of our attendees at this summit. Good storytelling, especially around climate change and these issues, but all good storytelling revolves around great characters, finding the people whose lives are being affected, telling their stories, letting them tell their stories. And in, the, in our broader theme here, Susan, of having a more inclusive conversation around this, having a focus on environmental equity and justice is going to places that we haven't often been before, to people who've been left behind or who've been left voiceless, to indigenous people, people living in coastlines who feel these stories and who feel this change first and foremost, and giving them that voice, letting them be, as I say, those characters. We're almost out of time. I wanna end very quickly with one last question from Lisa Palmer. She is our National Geographic Visiting Professor of Science Communication at GW now. And she says, Susan, who or what stands in the way of your goals? How can those obstacles be overcome? And you know, so if you think of those aspirational goals you were laying out, and I, it's unfair to give you a short moment here for this response, but what would you say are the, to, to Lisa's question, are the principal obstacles that stand in the way of achieving your aspirational goals? So I would say that, you know, when we look at sustainability and we talk to our employees, people are overwhelmingly supportive and want to do more and they want to get involved. When we look at our customers, we look at the public, we know that they are very interested in advancing this. And we have a lot of colleagues, a lot of other companies, a lot of organizations that are all kind of, you know, there's a groundswell of support for it. 
So it's not that there is a lack of passion and commitment on the part of people that's necessary to make this a reality, to push this forward. I think it's a matter of time. It's like, I feel like I'm always running out of time. There's not enough time to, in the day, to do all that we need to do around this issue. And I think it's going to take that kind of commitment and passion and, and, and resources to be brought to bear to get this done. People are busy living their lives and we have, a, we, we have to use our time in many ways. So for me, it's around how do you get more time to get it all done? Because I feel like the clock is ticking. So I don't think it's really around whether people are engaged and trying to convince people to do this. I think it's more around, you know, how much time do we have and how do we pull ourselves all together and coordinate the effort? I think that's the challenge, coordinating all these interested parties, organizations, universities, you know, public private sectors, bringing everyone together, converging them on a plan. I think that is a challenge. Um, so I, I think that's how I would answer that. Uh, coordinating the effort. That's that's a point well taken. Um, Susan Jen Davis, you've been unbelievably generous with your time. Thank you so very much. Thank you for all your insight and what you've shared. And thank you for what you do on both the operational level and on kind of the um, the mission level of, of, of this. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. And I'm glad our, so many students had an opportunity to pose questions as well. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Planet Ford. Thanks, everybody. I really look forward to working together on solving these big problems. So thanks for having me. We do too. Take good care. We'll see you very soon and say hi to Al. Tell him we'll catch him next time. Well, thanks to, as I mentioned, thanks to Comcast. Thanks to Susan Jen Davis. We move forward now. And I want to do a super shout out here for something that's really important. Every year we have our Story Fest Prize for the best storytelling from students from across the country and around the world. Uh, we partner with Lindblad Expeditions and we go on storytelling expeditions. Last year we went to the Galapagos. Uh, the year before that, we went with them to Alaska. We were going to go this year to Iceland and look at how climate change and, you know, that part of the world are interacting. Unfortunately, COVID intervened and we didn't travel. But we want to do a special shout out, a very public shout out here at uh, our Planet Forward Summit, virtual summit, to our StoryFest winners. Uh, Greta hardy Mitel from Carleton College wins for a Society for the Birds her look at, uh, at, at some really remarkable efforts to save the birds, multimedia podcasts in that category. Uh, Avery Van Etten from Northwestern University. She wrote a story, Sea Level Rise Threatens the Florida Keys. She wrote it as a three-part series. Uh, prize for the best photo essay, Kate Twining Ward. You met Kate a short time ago from the George Washington University. Clinging onto chimps, why you should think of chimpanzees during the climate crisis. And can I tell you, it was the cutest picture you'd ever see of, of, of the chimps that, that Kate shared uh, with us and with everybody else. In the short sustainable video category, Jake Myers from University of Arizona. You've met Jake over the course of this hour. Can urban farming feed the future? And he addressed that directly as he discussed going to Nairobi and beyond. Best video, Sarah Sem from the George Washington University. What's the beef with meatless burgers? She compared meatless burgers to meat burgers to see what their real sustainability and, and health contents, uh, how they compare. And finally, the fan favorite, the one that everybody voted, the people voted for, Deepti Banzal Gage, also from uh, GW. Wait before you squish that bug. I'm not going to tell you any more about that story. If you're interested in what that was, go to planetforward.org, look up Deep Deep Bunzel Gage and the Planet Forward 2020 Story Fest winners. You'll see all these stories and you can check them out and, and read and see and watch uh, what, uh, what these remarkable students have, have done and enter this year uh, and put, post your story because we want more. Okay, now I want to turn to a very, uh, very important person uh, to help us uh, bring our summit uh, discussion here today to a close. Megan Parker is the executive director of the Society of Environmental Journalists. Uh, prior to that role, she was the senior writer editor for partnerships and partnerships director um, for the Environmental Change and Security Program and the Global Sustainability and Resilience Program at the Wilson Center, which is a, <clears throat> excuse me, nonpartisan policy forum in, in, in DC. She's founder um, and editor in chief of the new security beat a daily blog about the environment, health, and security. And she was a supervising producer of a really interesting documentary series called Healthy People, Healthy Environment. Hi, Megan, how you doing? Good, how are you doing, Frank? I'm okay, I'm delighted you're with us. Society of Env Environmental Journalists, tell people what who that is and what that is briefly. Absolutely. So SEJ, which was founded in 1990, 30 years ago, is the North America's largest professional membership association for journalists that cover energy and environment. 
And as of right now, we have about 1,600 members in 43 countries, although the majority are in the US and Canada. And our mission is, is to increase public understanding of environmental issues by increasing and improving environmental journalism. And we do that by supporting the reporters who tell those stories. So I'm really glad to be here today to talk to, especially to the students who are the future of environmental journalism. Exactly. All right, so I wanna circle back with you on, on our main themes here, environmental equity, inclusion, and change. How, um, is, and, and, and to what extent are you involved with this discussion about making this a more inclusive conversation, uh, telling more stories from more points of view and making environmental journalists, frankly, a more diverse and inclusive lot? Yes, this is something that has been at the forefront of uh, our work as an organization for the last year. Um, we, uh, SEJ has long been an overwhelmingly white organization. Um, most journalists are white and the majority of environmental journalists um, have long been white. And so this is a, a challenge uh, that affects not just um, our organization, uh, but also uh, the audience for our stories. Uh, if our stories are not reflective and inclusive of people's experiences, they won't reach those audiences. So how do you make that happen? How, how, do you, how do you prompt change? It's more than putting an ad out there. Absolutely. I mean, institution was one thing I've learned this year is that institutional change uh, can be, is a long-term investment. Um, but also can move forward rapidly uh, in certain situations. We had begun this process of integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into our strategic plan in December, uh, following the, um, the uh, racial justice protests in June, we were able to move forward even more quickly uh, because of the urgency and the dialogue that emerged, particularly in newsrooms. So what does that put, involve? Does that involve going onto campuses and recruiting more aggressively from journalism programs and non-journalism programs? Does that involve uh, reaching out to communities of color in more creative ways? H how exactly does that happen? I think there's multiple layers. Um, from an organizational perspective, um, reaching out, as you said, beyond the, the silos and sort of the you know, usual suspects that um, we might have in the past is, is top of our agenda. In, um, turning to our uh, sister affinity journalism groups like the National Association of Black Journalists, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, Native American Journalists Association, and, and offering not to uh, you know, take over their work, but to engage their members and support those members who are interested in covering environmental issues and finding what works for them. It's, it's gonna be a pretty key piece of that work. Thinking about journalism itself, another area that we've worked at is funding stories on environmental justice. Um, we have just concluded a, a, a grant uh, opportunity that provided up to $5,000 for story projects. And more than 60% of the projects we funded uh, took an equity lens on the stories. Oh, that's they very interesting. That's very interesting. All right, last point here before we, before we wrap up to the students who are, who are watching, who are part of this, or people who are in any other place perhaps in an earlier mid-career, if they're interested in pursuing a career in environmental journalism, what's, what do you tell them? Yeah, and you have about 30 seconds for that, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, it is not a lucrative field. That's the number one thing. Um, but I will say that one of the reasons I got involved in SEJ is that it is a tremendously supportive community. Unlike some other fields, there is a very collaborative and cooperative uh, beat in journalism and people are very interested in helping each other tell this story better. Uh, so I would encourage you to join SEJ, that's number one. Um, and second thing is to look for those opportunities in unexpected places, look for um, fellowships, grants, do not talk yourself out of applying for, for these things. Be, it is a... Um, Everyone is looking to broaden that uh, that that pipeline uh, and 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 help support people as they take their first steps into 
what what is not what is a can be a rocky career path so we want to try to make it a little smoother and more sustainable career for people who want to tell these incredibly important stories incredibly important stories and i would just say that that's what one one of the things we do at planet forward we want to be your your platform we can help you publish so one thing to do whether you're a student or anywhere else is you know capture a story do a video do a infographic whatever it is that conveys something and and let us know and 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 we'll publish or help you publish uh here and and, and elsewhere um megan thank you very much really appreciate your time thank you all right i do though want to once again thank our sponsors who help us get here um from lindblad expeditions who as i mentioned provide the story fest prize uh to one tree planted planting one tree for every person who's joined this uh, summit discussion over these past three weeks, the Comcast who joined us today, and all the other wonderful organizations that you see on the screen there. Without their generosity and the generosity of many of you who are watching now, we would not be here and we would not be able to work with the students and the others in the way that we can and provide these opportunities, internships, travel opportunities, storytelling expeditions, and the rest. I also want to thank our pillar schools uh, ASU, Middlebury, University of Arkansas, University of Arizona, and GW, and our, con our uh, consortium schools, and our Planet Forward correspondents. Um, I'm going to share one last very personal note with you all. Last week, my father passed away. He was 19 years old, wounded in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. His generation was often referred to as the greatest generation for the challenge that they rose to. You, our students, are the next greatest generation. Your challenge is this challenge. It's a global challenge. And what you do and how you lead will determine whether we are victorious as a species, as humanity on planet Earth, and whether we can move the planet forward. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to the team that made this possible. Have a great day and thank you.